Hello, Moon Jelly Kevin here, and today I'm going to be talking about manga memories, specifically manga memories from the late 80s all the way up until the early 2000s, stuff that I'm personally nostalgic for. Now, granted, this has been multiple attempts at making this video. The problem is that there was a lawnmower and a leaf blower going on outside, and um, I figured, you know, just screw it. If, if it goes on again, I'm just going to continue. Um, if the manga crash of the mid-2000s to the late-2000s could not stop the power of manga, then I highly doubt that some lawnmower is going to stop my message today about the power of manga and why I love this type of comic. Now, manga is super topical right now because it is just killing it as far as sales. It is outselling Western comics. And um, I'm here to say that always wasn't the case, right? For those who are older like me ran remembers the roots of manga coming here to the states uh it kind of had a rocky start and there was a lot of mistakes that were made that i feel have now been ironed out um when we talk about modern comics or modern manga rather um modern manga is easy to get a hold of you guys could get them at a bookstore you could get them at a comic store um if you don't like that stuff there's plenty of digital distribution I'm sure there's plenty of pirate sites, but if you don't want to pirate it, you could just go on to Shonen Jump, which I totally say you should, right? Support the industry, right? Shonen Jump, the app is like less than $5. I want to say it's $1.99, and you get a limited access to a lot of quality books. And um, we're at a point now where I feel manga has been curated. The stuff that we're getting here in the States is usually just the best of the best. And it wasn't always the case. There was a huge manga boom in the early 2000s. And the crash happened probably in the mid-2000s and late 2000s. And a lot of that had to do with because of the shovelware of manga that was just coming out. Just lots of manga was coming out of here. And not every single title was always appealing. But they just figured, hey, let's just flood the market with any, any manga that ever came out. And, um, you know, they were coming out super fast, super cheap. Uh, the editing wasn't always so great on these books. There's a lot of typos um, sometimes. I'm not going to name some titles and throw some people under the bus here, but I will say that shoddy editing was something that um, was a common thing in the mid-2000s, mid late-2000s. Uh, whereas nowadays, you're just getting the best of the best, right? Now, don't get me wrong. If you like more niche manga, uh, there are definitely boutique type of publishers like Seven Seas Entertainment, just Google Seven Seas Entertainment and you could figure out what kind of manga they're putting out. I love digital manga publishing. Um, they put out the memoirs that I've talked about. The Day I Divorced God, The Day I Was Forced to Marry God, you know, from Tamasan, which I've talked about on this channel. Kimagore Orange Road is officially put out through them, which uh, is great. Before, you could only get it through scans. Now, you could own it legally. Um, and then they also put out some Tezuka stuff. So, huge shout out to digital manga publishing. I love their stuff. So um, if you want to check them out, check them out. But uh, also, the industry leader is Viz Media, which puts out the Shonen Jump stuff. That's like the best of the best, right? That's the stuff that was proven to have sold in Japan. Excuse me. And is continuing to do well in the West. So things like My Hero Academia, which, you know, is, let's be honest, the genre, it's a superhero book. And if you like superheroes out in the West, chances are you're willing to give it a try because... Manga is cheap, and the uh, amount of story that you get in each volume is quite a lot, right? Uh, but I'm not here to talk about modern manga. I'm here to talk about manga's past. I'm here to talk about what it was like growing up in the 90s and 2000s. And, um, you know, talk briefly about the 80s, which um, I wasn't, you know, fully formed as a human enough to speak specifically too much about the 80s. So if you are someone who lived through that, maybe you'll want to write about that in the comments below. But um, I did grow up poor, so that meant um, whatever was trendy for people that are roughly around my age, I was always five years behind. So I definitely have my fair share of um, some manga that was from the, the 80s, for sure. Okay. Um, Quick plug, real quick, my name is Moon Jelly Kevin. Probably should have done this in the beginning of the video. If you know you don't know who I am, welcome to the channel. I am a Los Angeles-based musician and cartoonist. Um, in regards to my music, we are having our first big post-vaccination show on uh, June 15th, Tuesday, June 15th, at Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles in Long Beach. 
one more time i'm having that big show as a musician roscoe's house of chicken and waffles my band is known as bootlegs of the untitled band we are um, kind of like an alternative rock band in the spirit of something like um nirvana pavement modest mouse the early modest mouse stuff so if that sounds like something you're into come to roscoe's house of chicken and waffles in long beach june 15th this tuesday and uh hopefully it'll be a good a time this is uh post-vaccine so we're all vaccinated i won't want to say it's post-pandemic so please practice social distancing guidelines as you guys know um, be safe out there use your common sense and the other thing i'm known for is i am a los angeles los angeles los angeles based cartoonist so i have over here my comic may plus amy the month of may comic strip i did all throughout may big fat stack of strips over here um, definitely manga influenced and if that is something you particularly are excited and interested in reading read it on the instagram at dissect my brain comics you could absolutely read it for free if you're waiting for the print edition the print edition will be coming in 2021 completely re-edited retoned um so stay tuned for that but if you can't wait for that um check it out like this okay and um it's interesting because um i put out my comic and i put it out in black and white and i kind of follow the manga format if you aren't familiar um real quick just to just to get you up to speed if you're not familiar with manga we're talking about japanese comics comics for the japanese market do you have to be japanese to make manga no there is definitely some mangaka some manga creators out there who are gaijin they're foreigners they're not from japan um but i will say that there are certain things certain tropes not tropes certain techniques that uh you will see in manga that sets it apart from western comics things like um huge expressions very expressive art you'll get plenty of close-up of people's faces and manga is more decompressed it's visual uh it's very cinematic i want to say there's more of a focus on visuals than than there is in dialogue if you just pick up a western comic from the 80s don't get me wrong i love 80s comics like uh i i i, gen I generally do that's probably my favorite decade of comics but if you pick up an 80s comic or even something before that like if you read the old like steve ditko uh stan lee spider-man's you know the classics um definitely more dialogue heavy whereas if you look at manga more emphasis on um you get like scene to scene um transitions um that uh focus more on the visuals and the expressions so those are definitely what uh sets manga apart and um yeah let's get to it so first off i want to show floppies right if you aren't familiar with floppies they are single issues um, let's see i want to put aside some stuff here and uh, I'm going to start first by talking about X-Men, the manga, which uh, I'm not a huge fan of. <laughs> but this was how they used to, excuse me, this is how they used to market um, manga back in the day, right? You would only get a single chapter. Like, that's it. You know, like, nowadays, you read a manga, uh, you get a whole volume, you get a whole Tonkaban. But back in the day, you would just get a single chapter. Like, that's it, you know? They figured, hey, we have all this source material coming from Japan. Let's just adapt it. And uh, we'll put it out like this, you know, like single chapter. This is what the Westerners were used to at the time. Some people are still used to the floppy. Um, I myself, I still buy my floppies. But yeah, they were floppies. And certain ways that they would try to get the Western audience is through adaptation. So... I know this looks like manga, and it's definitely manga, illustrated by Hiroshi Higuchi. <clears throat> but if you're familiar with the X-Men cartoon, this is basically the animated series. Like you guys can see, that's the scene of morph, morphing, right? Morph being the X-Men character specifically made for the X-Men animated series. So adaptations are one way um so you guys can see over here we have a uh, project echo project echo being a huge huge big deal in the uh, late 80s early 90s it was this anime and this is technically not this one's technically not manga like the only thing that's manga about it is the manga style but this is a straight up ad adaptation of this anime 
as you guys can see. And it kind of follows the principles of manga that I mentioned. More visual based. Uh, but this was another way that they try to get readers to start enjoying, you know, the Japanese medium because, excuse me, they um, adapted famous things like this. You know, like I said, here we go. Here's an ad for Project Echo. It was it was an anime first, and then they did this comic book adaptation. And again, how did how did they get people interested? Well, you know, a lot of Westerners were not inter um, a lot of Westerners were not. Uh, uh, into the idea of reading a black and white book. Like, they, you know, you, they see black and white, they automatically think it's too indie, you know? It's part of that self-publishing movement. Um, you know, even myself, when I try to put out my comic, some people still, like Westerners, have a hard time <laughs> reading this comic in black and white, which makes me think, should I do a color edition? Maybe I should do a color edition. Uh, but we'll see, anyways. But yeah, Project Echo. this one's not a manga. Um, it was just an adaptation of an anime. And it's funny, this penciler on this one is actually Ben Dunn, who is uh, best known for Antarctic Press Comics, which uh, popularized the anime and manga style. But that's something for another video. So yeah, um, those are some floppies. Here are some other floppies um, from different decades. Sorry, I should have arranged these chronologically. That would have been smart. Got Area 88, also known as... Uh, it's known as UN Squadron for people who like old school arcade games. Area 88. This one's from 1989. So that's that's going way back here. Uh, this is definitely a little later, I think. This is Mobile Suit Gundam, The Last Outpost from 1997. Man, Gundam. I love Gundam. I honestly do. Um, lots of, like, there's a lot of the 90s Gundams. You can't go wrong with them. You know, I understand some people not getting into the original 79 Gundam, but um, they're really killing it in the 90s. Like, I think there's a Gundam for everyone <laughs> that they can enjoy. But for whatever reason, Gundam never really caught on in the States. They had a huge effort um, here. I mean, I know uh, they still put out the model kits and stuff, but yeah, it didn't catch on like, like I think they wanted it to. Uh, Venus Wars. Studio Proteus. Okay, this is one of those... Um, 80s, 80s publishers that you might be familiar with even though this is from 91 venus wars again great movie you guys can watch this one um you could definitely still watch this uh, movie it's readily available venus wars nausicaa of the valley of the wind you know so just just to show you guys real quick maybe i'll do a deep dive later on some floppies. When we talk about floppies, we're talking about these single issues. Oh my goddess. Hyper Dolls. Oh my god. Are you familiar with Hyper Dolls? <laughs> I think, I'm trying to remember if this is the one with the funny dub, but I remember at least the, the theme song was hilarious. They localized the song and it was a, it was a thing. <laughs> it was a thing I listened to. Um, but yeah, this one, uh, it is kind of, um, you know, there was a lot of mangas like this where it was like, you know, the girl duo thing. Um, Skullman, Shotaro Ishinomori, best known for um, Cyborg 009. Cool stuff here. Just random page, right? Also known for Common Rider. Um, and then we have over here Orion. You know, just show you guys one last floppy from Studio Proteus. When did this one come out? So it was 93. Yeah. So yeah, uh, when you first get manga, you guys would get them like this. Like I said, single issues, floppies, basically just taking one chapter, trying their best to like really just uh, milk <laughs> the amount of money they could get out of, you know, new manga readers. And uh, one of my earliest memories is Maizan Ikoku. Are you guys familiar with Maizan Ikoku? It's a Rumiko Takahashi title, you know, best known for Inuyasha, Ranma One Half, Urusei Yatsura, you know, also known as Lum. And uh, it's a nice life comic, and it's just, you know, um, back in the day when, when a manga came out, anything with this manga art, as soon as you saw it, for me personally, I went and bought it. <laughs> <laughs> all right i wanted i wanted all the manga like i said first i was a american comic reader 
And then I was getting those early things like that X-Men, you know, manga or, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, you know, even in the late 2000s, they were still doing this, like these adaptations where it was in color. And yeah, it just did not appeal to me. And it was like, I just wanted to get anything. As soon as I saw this kind of art style, you know, I wanted it. So my Zanakoku, um, <laughs> you know, maybe not the coolest thing for someone in their preteens, teens to be reading, but um, it's a really funny, funny slice of life. Like, I know nowadays there's so many slice of life, and even my own comic, May Plus Amy, like, this is a slice of life. But I took a lot of inspiration from Rumiko Takahashi, because she does it so well. So, originally, when you read manga, it is from right to left. Um, that's how you read in um, Eastern countries. But, you know, f for us Westerners, you know, they figured that'd probably be too much work for people to get into. So they started publishing them left to right so that uh it was it was flipped as they say so that you can read it um in a way that's more palpable for us westerners you wouldn't see that today nowadays manga is kept in its original format from right to left so this is something that i said it's kind of like a time capsule something kind of like uh specific to, to back in the day four of these comics or so maybe a little bit more each of them are manga chapters and you would get them eventually collected in a trade paperback form or tankoban, all right, as they call it in Japan. Now, um, that's another thing, right? The place that I personally got a lot of manga stuff. So when it comes to these floppies, these were in bargain bins. They're still in bargain bins. You could still get them today if you want. Um, you could go to a swap meet which I was always super familiar with. I was, I was, I was at the swap meet every Saturday, the Alpine Village swap meet in, uh, in Torrance. Like my parents just took me there and 25 cents would get you, get you a comic, right? In some cases, 10 cents would get you a comic. But, um, if I went to, want to go to actual legit store and get a Tonko Bond, because let's face it, this is a way more convenient like, yeah, I know that you guys are taking this for granted. You're like thinking in your head, yeah, why would you not want to get the, the trade paperback? But it's not like it is today, right? Back in the day, this was this was how most people, your readers, were conditioned to, to read comics. They get in the floppy. The, the trade paperback market is fairly new. Um, I want to say like, you know, they, they started printing it more in the 90s and then early 2000s. It really took off. Like if you went to a Borders bookstore back in the day, you could easily get these. But things are still not as cheap. Like, um, I don't have, like, okay, I have this edition, right? I have some floppies. Definitely have some more lying around here. Um, then you have the trade paperback edition. Excuse me. But they kind of settled down later on with a price point of $10, like $9.99. But... That's not how it was right away. These trade paperbacks, they were 14, no, sorry, 16.95. This was $16.95. So, like I said, nowadays between manga back then and manga now, if you want if you want this exact same Maizan Koku, well, <clears throat> I have over here the signature edition and this is the fancy edition that's uh 24.99, but this is two volumes in one. Whereas opposed, this would be one volume in 1695. I don't have the one that came out between these. There's another Maizana Koku edition that came out where it was um, put out from right to left, where I believe it was 9.99 or 11.99, no more than 11.99 for sure. But um, yeah, it just shows you that over time, they started just giving you more bang for your buck. Well, um, <laughs> with with this first volume of Maizana Koku, like. 16.95, right? Like that doesn't sound affordable. Um, but like I said, if you were like me back in the day, if you just saw manga art, you wanted it. <laughs> you just you just picked it up. You didn't care what it was, right? So another example of like a flipped manga is uh, this My the Psychic Girl, which was originally put out, I believe, by Eclipse, and then uh, Viz put it out. <clears throat> 19.95. Um, illustrated by Ryuchi Ikigami who went on to do the Spider-Man manga, which I'd love to do a video on later on, but yeah, 
uh, My the Psychic Girl. One of those first comics that I looked at, and I was just like, look at that art. It's fantastic, right? To me, this was, like, realistic. It was like flipping through and watching a movie, you know? Um, but, yeah. Basic idea I want you guys to understand. First, you got these floppies. Ugh. Then you started getting these trade paperbacks. And like I said, it, they were hard to find. Um, I went to a place called Amazing Comics in Long Beach. And all their anime stuff, all their manga stuff, was like one shelf. You go to a Barnes & Noble now, like, it's multiple shelves. Like, you can <laughs> pick, your, pick, your, pick your poison, right? But it was like literally like one shelf the size of me, <laughs> right? So not that big. And um, a lot of the anime, the videos, um, the, the, the animation, they, they hit them in glass cases. And I, I kind of wonder, you know, like, okay, like not all of them were, you know, porn or hentai or whatever. But um, they, they just, for whatever reason, I guess they, they figured this is a premium product. Um, I guess talking about anime, buying anime back in the day, that could be a completely different topic some other time. But... Um, yeah, they kept it in a glass case, so it wasn't like you could look at the back and see, hey, is this for me? Or, or, or figure out, you know, is this something I like? You know, it was always like, you know, a special premium boutique. Like, they treated it that way, where it's like, it's a unique product. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about 2000s. Man, this video is going a little long, so I'm going to go kind of rush through to 2000s. In 2000s, you started to actually get the Tonka Bonds, so this is Loop on the 3rd. Um, I want to actually talk about this at some point because uh, the original manga is actually pretty gross and I don't understand, you know, well, I understand how Lupin got popular, but I'd love to talk about it in video form. But yeah, you started to get um, manga reprints in 2000. I talked about it. I showed you guys a floppy of Skull Man, but you guys could get a Skull Man Tonkamon over here. And like I said, all across the board, the price point, you guys could see that. $9.99. All of a sudden, manga was affordable. And manga was so affordable to the point that um, if you went to somewhere like Borders Bookstore, which is gone now, and they probably went out of business because of this, um, they always had a buy one, get one free. Or buy two, get one free sale for manga. Getting manga was like ridiculously cheap. It was super easy. And for a lot of people who grew up around this time, your brain is conditioned now where it's like, you're completely fine spending that roughly $10, $12 on a manga um, because of those reader habits that you probably developed from buying at somewhere like a Borders bookstore. Um, so, yeah. Um, just to show you some more stuff over here. And these were just a few years apart, right? This is the, sorry, this is the flipped edition of neon genesis evangelion that you guys could get that was 1595 right and they, they actually did these special collector's edition there that was originally from um right to left but this is like the flipped left to right edition man the the amount of money <laughs> i got back from from this one from this particular volume of evangelion um Man, I made my money's worth with this one. This one is like, this particular volume is such a good story arc. I highly recommend it. Volume 4. If you never read the rest of Evangelion the manga, at least read Volume 4. You've probably seen the anime where Shinji and Asuka have to do a synchronized um, attack on an angel. And the manga version is way better. And the expressions and introduction of Asuka is just so well done. And, uh... Why do I get a lot of money out of this? Because this is a huge influence. This particular volume is a huge influence on my own work. And then, yeah, look at that. You guys can see it. You have the flipped edition. That was $9.95. Sorry, not even $9.95. Sorry, $15.95. And this was put out... When was this? First printing, $19.99. Whereas you have over here the later edition completely redone not completely redone but just um restored back in its original form of reading from uh right to left 
And this was put out. Let's see. What's the year on this guy? <clears throat> this was put out in 2004. And what's the price point? $9.95. So yeah, manga got a lot more affordable in just a few years. So yeah, um, I think that's it. I mean, uh, I could show you guys some other stuff. I, <laughs> this video is already going way too long. Um, some other mangas I have. The Minion Tank. I want to show you guys the Minion Tank. This was an 80s one. Um, Eclipse International. <clears throat> Eventually Dark Horse got the rights. And then you got the trade. And then I wanted to show you guys, like I said, when we're talking about floppies, you had floppies of Evangelion. For Actually getting the anime was super expensive. So getting a manga seemed like more bang for your buck, right? Even if it was like a little bit more pricey. Like even though this was 14 or fifteen ninety five, like it was still cheaper than paying forty dollars for like the DVD or VHS that only had like three episodes, whereas this, you know, you could just open it up and enjoy as quick as instant like that, man. Okay, yeah, not in order anymore. Got some what's Michaels here for cat lovers, <laughs> and maybe I'll talk about these at some point. Time traveler, I, the more like. Um, <laughs> okay so um jerry conway who i totally respect recently said like uh you know he doesn't he thinks mangas for boob obsessed incels actual quote and i like jerry conway he wrote um you know he created power girl he wrote um the death of gwen stacy and uh, i guess you can't defend when you have manga like this right time traveler i um it was written by i ijima who was actually an adult star but this is just light fun, guys, <laughs> okay? Um, manga is more than just this. There's other, you know, manga is not just the pervy stuff, I, I assure you. But uh, just wanted to show this because I thought it would be a good laugh. And uh, lastly, I brought out some Shonen Jumps. Now, why do I have the same One Piece issue? Uh, I really like these uh, art that you guys get in this issue. Oh, man. Oh, sorry, it was right in the beginning. There's a lot of these wonderful One Piece spreads that I just want to uh, cut out and, uh, you know, <laughs> eventually frame. It's so interesting because we were at a point where Shonen Jump, they were trying their best to put it out like this. But, you know, when it's like, when this these, these stories have been out for years and most people were reading them, honestly, through piracy, um, it was kind of hard to make this. Like, it was kind of a tough sell right so i think that's why nowadays the the digital shonen jump is a much better option for people because it's not like um it's not like uh you know you could be up to date you'd be caught up with the latest chapter and it was such a weird moment in time though because they were trying to do shonen jump which has you know like a certain era of manga so you have like bleach one piece dragon ball right but then you also had like raijin comics which had kind of like the older shonen jump you know like you could see your city hunter fist of the blue sky um baki the grappler you know actually i think baki grappler was a little bit different but like fist of the north star you know that ip and city hunter those are more 80s you know so this is like interesting because you had like the 80s shonen jump book and then you had the shonen jump book just because the licensing was uh you know not streamlined across the board think of it this way like it's like the same idea with like these movies nowadays with like marvel has their marvel characters but sony has their marvel characters it's kind of like that right but as you guys can see these are relics of their time the the anthology phone book thing not an experiment that worked well in the uh, united states um but it was, I think it was mostly hurt because of piracy. And then I think the last thing I want to show, this is not even all my manga collection, uh, just Dragon Ball. You know, Dragon Ball was definitely, Dragon Ball and uh, Sailor Moon, definitely, like, they, they were the two things for at least, you know, mainstream audiences. Dragon Ball and um, Sailor Moon were the two things that uh, definitely, definitely created a huge boom for manga.
uh, once these came out yeah just like everything else you know kick the door open for everyone else now i personally really liked evangelion um i think that was more for like the the more hardcore fan but as far as like a casual fan who knows nothing about manga yeah dragon ball and sailor moon because of their connection to the animes that were being on cartoon network or um if you're like me and did not have cartoon network and just watched it on local tv at 6 a.m in the morning on old upn i don't know what it's called in other states um then yeah um you you definitely recognize this and you wanted to see more because usually i think like sailor moon had its own 50 episodes that just kind of repeated and dragon ball was the same way where it's like the same um you know you had the saiyans arc all the way up until the the Namek arc whatever it's called the frieza arc you know those episodes repeated over and over so you wanted to know more about what came before and what came after you had to get that comic because the comic was just more of the thing you loved good stuff a lot of different genres i mean like i said you got martial arts you got cats you got um horn stars <laughs> you got end of the world apocalypse you got tanks right like name your pick uh, you got everything over here. Crime, right? Whatever you guys want to enjoy. Like the, the there's, there's a manga out there for you, right? It's not just for boob obsessed incels, as Jerry Conway puts. Don't don't attack Jerry Conway. He's I'm sure he's a nice guy. All right, guys. He actually says he likes manga. So he said he likes Akira. So uh, Katsuhiro by Katsuhiro Otomo. So <laughs> I'm saying there's a manga for everyone, even the guys who say manga is just for boob obsessed incels thank you for watching this video and have a wonderful day bye